Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of a Bible prophecy adventure. The last time we met, we looked at part two of the handwriting on the wall and we saw where God stepped in once Babylon's cup of iniquity was full and Belshazzar taught it right to drink from the holy vessels that his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar took away from Jerusalem. In those days, you know, people used to take away trophies from the conquered nation to show that their God was superior to the God that they defeated. But this God, the God of heaven, was the God that had given Judah into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar because of Judah's disobedience and their turning away to serve other gods. But over the years, we have seen how God tried to reach out to the kings of Babylon, right? Especially Nebuchadnezzar. We saw in the first episode how Daniel chose to eat the right diet and how brilliant he was at the end of three years that he and his friends were elevated to top positions in the kingdom. Then we saw when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that nobody could tell him because he had forgotten it. But God told Daniel after he and his friend got together for a prayer meeting and Daniel was able not only to tell the king his dream but also what he was thinking before he went to bed. That astounded Nebuchadnezzar and he acknowledged Daniel's God as a God of gods. Then we saw where he forgot what he had learned in chapter 2 and he decided to build an, an image of gold, fully gold, from head to toe, thus signifying that his kingdom would last forever. And he had made a fiery furnace for anyone who would not bow down and worship his image. And there were three faithful followers of God, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who decided that whether or not God saved them, they would not bow. And they were cast into a furnace that was heated seven times more than it should have been heated. So much so that the guards who threw them in died instantly. But Nebuchadnezzar, when he looked again, he saw four men loose and walking in the fire. And he said, did not we throw three men in the fire? How is it that I see four men? And he called them out. There was no hurt on them. Neither was there the smell of smoke on them. Right? And we saw God making a final attempt to reach Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4. When after he warned Nebuchadnezzar in a dream that if he did not change his way, he was going to be cut down. And when Daniel alone could once again interpret the dream. Right? Nebuchadnezzar um, he did Daniel's counsel for a year but when he saw the glories of Babylon his pride swelled up in his heart and he stood on his balcony surveying his mighty terrain and he said is not this the great Babylon that I have built by the might of my power and immediately a voice said to him oh King Nebuchadnezzar your kingdom is taken away from you. You will be a madman. And he was stark raving mad for seven long years. His hair became matted. And his fingers and toenails grew like, bird, like bird's claw. And he ate grass for seven years. A, a total vegetarian diet. And his mind got clear at the end of the seven years on a vegetarian diet. And he decided that... God was to be served. He realized that God was to be served. And in the end of his days, he extolled and praised the name of the Most High God. And then in chapter 5, we saw the ending of Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar's grandson decided that he was going to take God's holy vessel in his pride and drink from them right that was the end of it 
a hand as he and his concubines and his thousand lords were drinking from God's holy vessel. A bloodless hand wrote over against the candlestick on the opposite wall and his knees smote together as the hand wrote, Mini, Mini, Tekel, Ufarsim. No one in the banquet hall, not his magicians, Zari, Soothsayer, the Chaldeans, could interpret that until Daniel was called and Daniel was able to tell him, you saw what happened to your grandfather. You saw how God has been reaching out to him and what God did and how God restored his kingdom and how your grandfather was changed. But you decided to go against God by drinking from his holy vessel. This is the writing and here is the meaning. Mini, mini, tekel ufarsim. Thou art weighed in the balance. Thou art weighed in the balance. This was said twice. Why was it said twice? Because remember now, um, Belshazzar's father had given himself over to religious things. So the king was now in religious thing, right? So that's religion. And the son was in charge of the state, that civil power. There was a union of church and state going on and God stepped in and destroyed that. Mini, mini, mini for religious, religious leadership. Mini again for civil leadership. Tekel, you are weighed in the balance and found wanting. You are found wanting. This night your kingdom is divided and given to the needs and the Persians. And that night, the Bible says, was Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Mede, being 60 and two years old, took the kingdom. Now we're going to look at chapter six of Daniel. But before we do that, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your holy book, the Bible, in which you have outlaid everything that we need to know so that we can believe that you are God. You did say in Isaiah and Jeremiah that you are the one who knows the end from the beginning. If there is a, if, if there's another God, let him come forth and tell the future, if he can. And so far, Lord, we have seen none other God. And we want to thank you, Lord, that in your great love, you decided to divulge to us the secrets of your thoughts. And we appreciate it. Lord, as we study, we are asking that you will send your Holy Spirit. Please send your Holy Spirit to be with us so that he can teach us to interpret your writings correctly. And not only that, but to apply them to our lives so that the lessons that we learn from the historical part of Daniel we can apply them to our lives because you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. We love you and we trust you. And we want to learn your words so that we can apply your words to our lives. And now, Lord, I ask that you will make me a simple nail upon the wall. So insignificant and so small, so small. And on that itty bitty nail upon the wall hung a beautiful portrait of your son's face. So that as we behold him, we may be changed from glory to glory into your likeness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And so, you know, our lesson for today is about the den of lions. The den of lions. God has given us these reports because they are not fairy tale, they are true stories, so that as we read them, we can have faith and know that what He has done for His people in the past, He will also do for us. But we have to be faithful. Okay? And there is my email. Any questions, any thoughts, feel free to send it to prophecymama.457 bc at gmail.com. Prophecymama.457 
I put prophecy mama because at my age, if I can understand the prophecies of Daniel and the revelation, so can you if you are younger than me. And even if you are older than I am, you can understand the prophecies. So every time I look at that, and every time you look at that email, I want you to remember that the prophecies can be understood. Okay? And so, the title of our lesson, Den of Lions. Den of Lions. All right. We are going to start now. It's really an interesting lesson. Den of Lions. Here is a picture of Daniel among the lions. See how placid they are, calm. Why? Because God had sent his angels and had shut the lion's mouth. Now the first five chapters of the book of Daniel relates to the history of Babylon with the fifth closing with the transfer of power to the Medes and the Persians in 539 BC. With the overthrow of Babylon, Darius the Mede, uncle of Cyrus the Great, sat on the throne of Babylon at the age of 62. When Darius died about two years later, Cyrus became the sole emperor of the Medo-Persian Empire. Our story therefore took place between 539 BC and 536 BC. Upon ascending the throne, Darius went about organizing the government of the 120 provinces that comprised the Medo-Persian Empire, which stretched from Egypt to India. Over these provinces, he placed 120 satraps. The satraps were to report to the presidents so that the king would sustain no harm. So here we see when Darius took the throne, he placed rulers over 120 provinces. These rulers were called satraps. And over these 120 satraps, he placed three presidents. And, and this was so that he would sustain no harm financially or politically, right? Now, of the three presidents, who was the chief president? And we are going to start by reading Daniel 6, verses 1 and 2. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom an hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole realm, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was the first, that the princes might give account unto them, and that the king should have no damage. So we see here that Daniel was the first of the three presidents to which the 120 satraps should rule. Now, this wouldn't sit well with them because Daniel was what they considered a slave. You know, what the beauty with slavery in those days was that even though you were a slave, you could be up in government. You remember Joseph? Joseph was a slave, but he was, sec he was the second person to Pharaoh. Only in the throne was Pharaoh higher than Joseph, yet he was a slave. And here we see Daniel being a slave, but he was the first of the three highest presidents, right? But as the years go by and as we moved over to the new world, slavery become a, became a very, very ugly thing that not even God acknowledged. But we're not talking about that. Let's move on to the next. Um, reading. The organization of the kingdom as effected by the Babylonian monarchs is given in the first verse of this chapter. Right? So there was 120 provinces and the king decided to set those 120 provinces 
were there before the king came and he set rulers over them, right? They were Babylonian provinces and he continued with it. The kingdom had 120 provinces. Now immediately Darius placed 120 princes, that's rulers, over these provinces. The change in the administration to the government is of utmost importance since the strength of the emperor's rule is in proportion to the strength of cooperation and sympathy of the subject prince, the princes who were and now under Persian rule. Over the 120 satraps, that's provincial ruler, Darius placed three presidents so that the peace of the central government would be maintained. Daniel was made the chief president to whom everyone was accountable. Question. Why was Daniel given the highest position in the newly formed government? Why was Daniel given the highest position in the newly formed government? We read verse 3. And verse 3 tells us, then this Daniel was preferred above the princes, the presidents, sorry, and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king taught to set him over the whole realm. So Daniel was going to give that first position because he had an excellent spirit. It was not after the order of the world that Daniel belonging to a race that was held in bondage, should be given one of the highest positions in the newly organized government. It was even more unusual, seeing that Daniel had been made the third ruler of Babylon by Belshazzar just before the kingdom was overthrown. The first and second verses of Daniel 8 shows that Daniel was not likely, sorry, that Daniel was very likely not a stranger to the new government for he lived in Shushan in the province of Elam. That's where he got the vision of uh, Daniel chapter 8. During the time of Belshazzar's rule, Elam was overrun by Persian soldiers. To the fact of Daniel's acquaintanceship may be added that an excellent spirit and unsurpassed business ability of Daniel. These brought him into prominence in the Middle Persian Empire. What should be the Christian's attitude when conducting business? You know, as Christians, we are to strive to be like Daniel. Can you imagine? he was of such an excellent spirit that Darius the Mede didn't think it strange to make a bondman who was a statesman in Babylon his head hunchman <laughs> right the, the head hunch, honcho in, over his kingdom the head man over his kingdom because he saw that Daniel had an excellent spirit and he didn't take long to see that because he only reigned a little more than two years before he died. But within that, that space of time, that short space of time, he saw that Daniel had an excellent spirit. Can that be said of us as modern day Christians who call ourselves followers of God? Can our employers and those with whom we work see that we have an excellent spirit? So what should the Christian attitude be like when conducting business affairs? We are going to look at Proverbs 17.25 and Proverbs 22.29. And it tells us that a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. That's Proverbs 17.27. Proverbs 22.29 says, Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Here is recorded the case of a man who was a devout follower of God. Daniel's honesty, accuracy, and skill in every particular was a wonder to the world.
His conduct is a powerful witness to every Christian as to how to perform the duties and privileges of every business venture undertaken. Daniel was a noble statesman, yet not a politician, an example for all office holders. He fulfilled his duties under the Medes and Persians just as faithfully as under the Babylonians. He served the God of heaven and not a man-made party. A businessman does not necessarily have to be a sharp policy man, but may be instructed by God at every step. When he was prime minister of Babylon, Daniel, as prophet of God, was receiving the light of heavenly inspir inspiration. The world's statement are worldly, ambitious scheming, and is compared in the Bible to the grass of the field and to the fading flowers. The Lord is pleased to have men and women of intelligence in his work if they will remain true to him. By the grace of Christ, we may preserve the integrity of our character when surrounded by adverse circumstances. Like Daniel, we must make God our strength so that we will not be forsaken in our time of greatest need. Right? So if we represent God well, we can be sure that God will never forsake us. Right? But if we are haphazard, and neg 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 neglectful and scheming in our dealings with others and in business, God cannot stay close to us because God is not like that. All right? Let's move on. What further advice do the scriptures give about our conduct in executing our duties? We're going to look at Romans 12, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, and Colossians 3, verse 17. Let's hear what the Word of God has to say to us. We are told in Romans 12, verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So when we are doing business, we should not be slothful. We must be fervent in our spirit as if we are serving the Lord. Because when we do business, we do serve the Lord, especially when we do it well. All right. Next one is whether therefore ye eat or drink. And that's 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Your prime minister, your president of the United States, do it to the glory of God. Right. You are sweeping the sidewalks in front of a bodega do it to the glory of God you are cleaning the toilets do it to the glory of God you are the secretary of state do it to the glory of God whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do do all to the glory of God and the next one says and whatsoever ye do in the word and sorry and whatsoever and the next one says and whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So whatever you're doing, remember that you're not just doing it for the boss. You're not just doing it for the pay. You are doing it to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that when your co-worker and your bosses or your employees look at you, they can see that you are a man or woman of a different caliber and they can trust you and respect you and like you and want to be like you and to know your God. The very position that Daniel occupied in the kingdom put him to the severest test. He had to deal with all the under rulers who were obliged to serve, who were obliged to give him an account this was so that the king would suffer no loss, right? No financial loss. The officials were scheming politicians who would rob the king blind in every possible way. There were bribery, cheating, 
wire pulling and buying positions in government office. And when they collected the taxes, a large percentage of the collections went into their account. Question five, what damage does the Bible say that a scheming government official can affect upon the country? Proverbs 29 verse four and Deuteronomy 16 verse nine. Let's hear what the Bible has to say about those. Proverbs 29 4 says to us, the king by judgment establisheth the land, but he that receiveth gifts overthroweth it. A man in political office who is prone to receiving bribes and gifts from people can't run the government right because the person who gives him the gift pulled the string, right? And that is why the Bible talks about rulers receiving gifts. We human beings are prone to want to be nice to those who are nice to us. So God, from the beginning, tells us that ruler should never accept money or bribes from anybody over which they have rule, right? Next one, Deuteronomy 16, verse 19. Here God is telling the rulers again, thou shalt not rest judgment, don't twist judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take gift, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. So you might go into the political office right and nice, you know, and upstanding and honest, but the minute you start to take a gift, your honesty chips away little and little because now that person who has been giving you gift owns you. Unless you are brave enough to give him back the gift, that man will, or woman will own you for life or that corporation will own you for life. And that is why God said, uh-uh, don't take gifts when you are in a position to judge and rule people. All right? There is nothing new under the sun. The history of mankind always repeats itself. The governments of today are offshoots of the same root with which Daniel had to deal. And by studying, you will get vivid detail of the government back then. Roman history, with its stories of th trust, murders, manipulations, corporations and bribery within and without the Senate, is the history of Babylon. The history of France during the revolution repeated the same history. The same stories are repeated in the history of England, the continental countries, and the United States. So that kind of corruption has jumped the Atlantic and is still in the United States. Don't you see it? That's the human nature. People love money and those who have money think it is their duty to bribe their way into whatever they want. And so the governments of this land are skewed towards those who have money, right? But if you are a governmental leader that will not take money, right? While the people might not like you, they will respect you because they will say, this man cannot be bought, this woman cannot be bought. The story of Daniel shows how a man or a woman of God, when elevated to, high, to a high position, can remain uncontaminated. It not only shows the attitude a Christian is to assume towards vice and corruption, but also shows what treatment a principled person is expected to receive from the hands, right, of those who are corrupt. So if you are principled, don't think you are going to get good treatment. Those who are corrupt are going to try to bring you down. But there is a God in heaven that overrides and overrules even this, the, the, the cunningest scheme of men. You know, if you are true and you have a backbone, God will stand for you if you can stand for right, like the needle to the pole, unmoved, unmoved. So what did the presidents and rulers realize as they went looking for some faulty conduct of Daniel? Daniel 6 verses 4 and 5. 
And it says, Then the president and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So they searched and they searched and they looked and they tried to find something wrong with the books and wrong with this concerning the work that Daniel had done. And they couldn't find one thing. They could not find a thing. And so they said, we can't find anything against this man. Ah, I know. If we, if we come up with something against this God, we got him. And they came together and that was their plan, right? <laughs> I tell you, Lord is good. Because Daniel faithfully guarded the king's interest, Darius was about to set him over the whole realm. This added fuel to the deep-seated envy of the other presidents and rulers, and they desperately sought for this honest evidence against him. But the honesty of a just man is like a thorn in the flesh of the unjust. And in their political meetings, the princes and presidents sought to destroy the man who made accurate reports and who was faultless in his dealing. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar is a principle of divine government. And from this principle, Daniel could not be swerved. Every scheme they tried came to a dead end. And yet it was common knowledge that it was useless to bring a complaint about the work of Daniel. There was but one possible way to condemn him, and that must be concerning his religion. Even on that point, they could not openly accuse him, but must accomplish their goal in a clandestine manner. They looked for everything to, to go against Daniel, but they couldn't find anything. Even in his religion, he was faithful. So in order to achieve their goal, they had to do it in order a clandestine way you know not openly so that whoever they are presenting it to won't be aware of what they are doing right so before long their underhanded methods brought them into direct conflict with Daniel's God and not with Daniel the individual so now they were fighting Daniel's God because you know when you touch God's children you touch God right Question six. Question six says, what grand and glorious scheme did they produce to rid themselves of Daniel? We are going to read Daniel 6, verse 6 to 8. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lion. You know what? You know what? Before I go any further in reading that, it just occurred to me. That was one of the most ridiculous plot. Because how did these men ask for their breakfast? Because whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man shall be thrown into the, the den of lions. Didn't they ask their wives for breakfast and dinner and lunch? Or didn't they ask their, their wives, honey, can you press my shirt for me? Or honey, can you find my socks for me? Or, honey, can you give me a drink of water? Didn't they ask a petition? What, isn't that a petition? It, it, you know, the schemes of evil men are so stupid and foolish. They should have been thrown in the lion den from day one because they did ask their wife or their children to go catch the, go and fetch the iPad. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the Medo-Persian iPad. They did. 
or can you bring my sandals? Isn't that a petition? And that's what anyone who asks a petition of any God or king, let's look at it again. They said that whosoever shall ask a petition of any man, any God or man for 30 days, save thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. It just occurred to me. It was one of the most silly things because I am sure they broke the rule when they ask the wives for the dinner or the lunch or the socks or the shoes or tell the children to go fetch something for them. Right? Because those people are man, mankind. But you know, when you're evil, you're evil. What can I say? When you are evil, you are just evil. Now, O king, they continued, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians which alter it not. So you see, the laws of the Medes and Persians were what we call infallible. And I want you to keep that in mind as we go through the rest of Daniel, right? The laws of the Medes and Persians were infallible. It couldn't be changed. No matter how ridiculous it was. With pretended respect for the king and with flattery on their lips, a committee of princes waited for Darius. And the first words they spoke revealed that there was a plot afoot, for they said all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, etc., and the officers had consulted together when in truth they had held secret meetings and the chief of the presidents, Daniel, was kept in the dark. The king placed great confidence in his prime ministers and anything intended to have his approval was accepted without further investigation because he too was a proud king. The form of a decree was presented to the king. It exalted Darius above all earthly monarchs and attempted to place him above God. This pleased the king, the vanity of men. Eh? <laughs> the vanity and pride of men. This pleased the king. He was not aware that the decree was a design against Daniel. The document was to be signed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which alter it not. The document was constructed to stroke the ego of the king, placing him above all other earthly monarchs. But when it prohibited the people from approaching the throne of God with their request, the battle was transferred to another realm. Now God was involved, right? Thus two immutable laws, the laws of the Medes and Persians, and the law of God, possessor of heaven and earth, were pitted against each other. For 30 days, no one was to make petition of any man or God except the king. What was God to do? <laughs> Daniel 7. How did the king react to such a self-pleasing ego stroking the key, decree? Daniel 6 verse 9. Daniel 6 verse 9 says, Wherefore the king signed the writing and the decree. It stroked his ego so much... that he signed the writing with the decree. Didn't look into it. Man always want to be petted and pampered and, and be told how great thou, thou, thou art. There is only one great thou art and that is the God of heaven and earth. Every other God, every other man has to bow to him when he speaks. They can't do what he did. They can't make heaven and earth and they can't make life. No matter how much they are trying to do so in the laboratories of this world. They can't tell the end from the beginning. They don't know what's going to be happening in the next second. But they want their egos to be stroked. And they want to be told how great thou art. Look at King Jong-un over in North Korea. The people have to be singing to him and telling him he's a great king. Right? Great ruler. Even though they are starving to death and not eating what he and his children are eating. They're not eating that. But you have to tell him that he is great. I don't know why man always want to be great. 
and they don't even rule with kindness you know they don't even rule with kindness but they want to be great what can I say may the good Lord help us as we have to deal with these egotistic politicians right so when the king heard this the king signed the decree King Darius, ignorant of their evil purpose, placed his seal upon the document, making it into the law of the land. Though he was ignorant of their plot, his reason for signing such a decree was wrong. Pride is an abomination in the heavenly courts. Therefore, this decree must fall. While the Medes and Persians knew about God, they did not know him. We find that in Isaiah 45 verse 5. An actual experience was needed and God would manifest his power through the same faithful servant who had witnessed for him 68 years. Right? Just as God did for Babylon, he was about to do for Medo-Persia to let them know that surely there is a God in heaven who can turn the glory of kings, popes, and prelates into dust. So Darius, with his ego properly stroked, decided that he would sign a ridiculous decree. And he did, because it appealed to his pride. Pride is something else. It always comes before a fall. But it provided God with an opportunity to show these heathen kings and rulers that there was a God in heaven and that Daniel was serving God that God says the Lord in Isaiah 45 verse 6 I am the Lord and there is none else there is no God beside me I gird thee though thou hast not known me so although Darius didn't know God God is let is going to let him know that I am the one who girded thee though you didn't know me as a matter of fact it was God who told Cyrus you know i'm going to use you to defeat babylon and i'm going to use you to cause my people to return to their land question eight how did daniel react to the signing of the decree did daniel say lord let me see how i can get by without the seeing me did daniel do that nope daniel 6 verse 10 says now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened towards in his chambers, in his chambers towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four times. So that was Daniel's um, custom. Three times a day to go and pray, opening his windows with his face looking towards Jerusalem, praying to the God of heaven. And when God, Daniel knew that that decree was signed, he did not change. He did the same thing. He was going to pray to his God three times a day with his windows open and his face looking towards Jerusalem, although Jerusalem was destroyed. Right? He did not change. Though Daniel was anxious to be at peace with all men. He did not allow any power to interrupt his intimate moments with God. No power. Daniel was true, noble, and generous, and he was willing to comply with those who ruled over him. But no king or decree could turn him from his allegiance to the king of kings. What can turn you from your allegiance to the king of kings? Can you be bought? So that you stop serving God? Can you be bought? Or is there nothing that can take away your allegiance from God? He was also no coward. Aware of the purpose of his enemies, he did nothing unusual with regards to his earthly duties. He continued his duties as usual, right? He would not necessarily provoke the wrath of his enemies. However, he had a custom to meet with God in prayer three times a day. And he would not be deterred. 
right? No matter what law they signed, Daniel would not be deterred. At the appointed times, he went to his chambers, opened the windows as was his custom to do, turned his face toward Jerusalem, and knelt to pray. He pleaded with God for strength to be faithful. Right? What are the appointed prayers, prayer time mentioned in the Holy Bible? What are the times that are appointed in the Bible for us to meet with God and pray? We look at Psalms 55, verse 16 and 17. And here the psalmist says, As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening, morning, and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. All right? So Daniel prayed at the time of the evening and morning sacrifice, I would presume, and one more time in between. Right? You know, I know we are not living in the ancient days of Daniel, but it's not a bad thing to practice what is written in the Bible. You know, although it might not be law, it's not a bad thing to um, practice what is written in the Bible. And if uh, the psalmist says evening, morning, and noon, let us try to see if we can do that, you know? You know, I mean, we might be at work and we can't go and kneel down, but at least you can say a prayer in your heart. God will still hear. Daniel had a special meeting place and an appointed hour when he met the Lord and these appointments were kept. There is a beauty in the thought of the soul connection between Daniel and heaven. His spiritual life was an actual thing, a life which he lived as real and as true as the physical life. The only life which his enemy knew or could comprehend was the physical life. To sever the intercourse with God would be as painful to Daniel as to deprive him from the natural, from as to deprive him of natural life. As Christ withdrew to the mountains after his soul harrowing labors, so that he could commune with the Father and be refreshed to continue working for lost humanity. So Daniel sought God in prayer. Prayer is the Christian lifeline. You can't be a Christian without a prayer life. It's your lifeline. When you pray, heaven comes down. When the pressures of life are the greatest upon us, and we have the greatest need to be filled, it is then that we should seek to abide in the presence of the Lord so that he who balances the cloud on high and maintains equal air pressure all around us so that we can walk upright and erect will so maintain the equilibrium of our lives. Hallelujah. Question 10. When the conspirators found Daniel praying, what did they do? Daniel chapter 6, verse 11 to 13. So, so, they set up Daniel. They knew he would pray. <laughs> Remember I said, they couldn't find anything against him except against the law of his God. And so they came up with this, this uh, no petition of man or any king anybody else except the king for 30 days so they knew that Daniel always prayed because he always goes by his window and turn his face towards Jerusalem and pray three times a day so they got him there right so when they they knew that they came near to Spinal and the Bible tells us in Daniel 6 13 and 11 to 11 that then these men assembled right they assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any God or man within 30 days save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? 
The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which alter it not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but he maketh his petition three times a day. Uh, <laughs> I can just imagine the king's face when he realized just what he had done. I can just imagine that. I can just imagine the king's face when he re realized what, how he was tricked, you know? And, and the law couldn't be changed. <laughs> oh man, the ego of men always get them in trouble. Always get them in trouble. Noble and true is the one who has God ruling in his heart. Underhanded and mean are the actions of those who yield to the influence of Satan. When men choose Satan as their leaders, all that is noble is lost. Satan sat unseen in the councils of those evil officials as they plotted against God's servant. And after the, the decree was signed, he instigated them to set spies to watch him. They saw Daniel kneel in his usual place of prayer. Three times each day, they heard his voice raised in earnest prayer supplication it was enough the accusation to the king was made against that Daniel which is of the children of the captivity of Judah question 11 how did the king react when he realized the evil design behind the decree Daniel 6 verse 14 then the king when he heard these words was so displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver Daniel that's how much the king liked Daniel you know when he realized what he had done I can just imagine seeing him calling all the senators and councillors and saying find a way that that Daniel cannot go in the lion then I didn't realize what I was doing but the laws of the Mede and the Persian cannot be broken. See if there is a loophole that we can use. And he labored from morning till the going down of the sun. But he could find nothing to undo the laws of the Mede and Persians that cannot be broken. Can you imagine that? If some scheme should be plotted against you and I in our workplace, will our bosses be laboring to make sure that we don't get fired will they be laboring and trying to find a way to make sure that we stay on the job let us dare to be Daniels right dare to stand alone dare to have a purpose known and dare to make it known all right he was so displeased and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver Daniel for the first time, the evil design of the counselors flashed across the mind of Darius. A decree signed with the king's seal was unalterable in the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. Yet the king spent the entire day pleading with those in high authority and searching for some way of escape. But with satanic smiles, those princes countered every argument of the king with the immutableness. It, the, with, the immutab with the immutableness of the laws of the Medes and Persians. Everything the king did, they said, remember the laws cannot be altered. Ah, uh, question 11. While the king delayed to execute judgment against Daniel, what did these men do when they saw that he was delaying? What did they do? Daniel 6.15. It says... Then these men assembled unto the king. They came together now before the king and said unto the king, O king, know, O king, know, O king that the law of the Medes and the Persian is that no decree or statute which the king established may be changed. So they came to him with the law. You know, king, you can't break this law because the law of the Medes and Persian said that any decree you make cannot be changed. 
when the hands of men are tied, when there is no power on earth to help. Lord, I want to see your faces. <laughs> Let me read this again. It says, when the hands of men are tied, when there is no power on earth to help, then is God's opportunity. And I say, Amen. Amen. The king had labored until sunset and found no way out. But Daniel's prayer still ascended. Daniel's prayer said, It is time for thee, Lord, to work. Keep me in perfect harmony with thee. So while his own heart was in sympathy with heaven, there was no power on earth which could deprive him of life if God desired him to live. And God desired that Daniel should live. Right? We see that. <laughs> Question 12. What did the king say to Daniel just before putting him into the lion's den? Daniel 6, 16 and 17. You know, and that is why we must live good, good lives, you know. Let me talk to us, right? That's why as Christians, we must live good, noble, clean, pure lives, right? So that our influence on, on those around us will be such that they will want to deliver us from calamity and they will, they will know that we serve the true and living God, right? So we have to make sure that our profession and our practice are equal. Wanting people to eat and even children is a hypocritical Christian. So question 12 says, what did the king say to Daniel just before he put him into the lion's den? Daniel 6, 16 and 17 reads like this then the king commanded and they brought daniel and cast him into the den of lions now the king is an heathen king right now this heathen king spake and said unto daniel thy god whom thou servest continually he will deliver thee he said that to daniel just before the stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. But just before Daniel went down into the den, this king leaned over and said to Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. He started to get faith. Because of Daniel's faithfulness, the king started to get faith. The king could not undo the law of the Medes and Persians, and so Daniel was lowered into the den. However, just before he lowered Daniel into the den, the king told Daniel that his God would save him. How did the king know about the power of Daniel's God? Is it possible? That Darius had heard the miracle of deliverance of the three Hebrews from the fiery furnace? Is it also very probable that he had heard of the handwriting on the wall just before Babylon fell a few years before? And is it also very likely that Daniel had told him about the God of the Hebrews? And so the king decided to exercise faith in Daniel God. Feigning loyalty to the king, Daniel's accusers lowered Daniel into the den, closed the mouth with a large stone, and sealed it with the king's signet, as well as with those of the various lords. Satan exalted as he did years later at the Savior's tomb. But no power on earth could hold Daniel in the dens of lion than could keep Christ in the grave. The angel came not to the stone, but into the den. And one of the most precious times for Daniel was when he sat in the center of the cave with those lions crouched at his feet or fondly licking his hands. <laughs> How did the monarch spend the night and what did he do ne the next day? Daniel 6 verse 18 to 20. Right? Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting, no food. Neither were instruments of music brought before him. He didn't want to hear any song or music. 
and his sleep went from him, couldn't sleep. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the dens of lion. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? The king couldn't sleep, couldn't eat, couldn't listen to music. He didn't sleep. And as soon as the sun was coming up, that heathen king, taking God at his word, ran to the den of lions and cried to Daniel, Daniel, did your God save you? Maybe he was not expecting to hear a voice, but our God is good. Our God is good. The Lord is good. The king's heart was sad and he spent the night in fasting and prayer. No music was brought in before him. He could not even sleep. The sun was barely, the sun had barely peeped over the mountain top. And we find the king hastening to the den in the early hours of the morning. Arriving at the den, he called in a lamentable voice, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lion's den? He gave God his title. You see that? He said, the living God. <laughs> How did he know that? Daniel was doing his work, man. Daniel was a faithful missionary. How about you? Who at your job knows that you are a Christian? Who at your job knows that you're a Christian? Or are you busy mingling with the crowd, pretending to be like one of them so that you don't stand out? Our brother Daniel didn't do that. And God cannot stand for you if you're ashamed of him. The Bible tells us that those who honor God, God honors. Right? But he has light regard for those who disdain his name. Question 14. Did the king get an answer from the den? We are going to look at Daniel 6 verses 21 and 22. And these verses say, Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angels and hath shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocence was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Imagine the joy of the king when from the inner recesses of the den he heard Daniel's voice respond to his plaintive question. Satan and his wily cohorts were defeated. Here was a type of another stone that was to be rolled away when our Savior would come triumphant from the rented sepulchre. With great joy, the king ordered Daniel to be hoisted from the den and no hurt was found on him. And I say, hallelujah, hallelujah, right? He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And if you stand for God, no hurt will come to you also. No hurt. Question 15. What became of Daniel's accusers? Daniel chapter 6, verse 23 and 24. Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel and cast them into the dens of lion. Them, their children, and their wives. I wouldn't want to be married to any of those men. And the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came to the bottom of the den. Before they even hit the bottom of the den, the lion was eating them. <laughs> he broke all their bones in pieces before they reached the bottom of the den. That is to say, you know, to the critics who say, but the lions were not hungry. How come they eat those? You tell me. 
Tell me that the lion was not hungry. Just in case you think the lion were not hungry. When Daniel's accusers and their families were cast in the den, they were crushed and devoured at once. Once again, the nations saw that Israel God had power to preserve his people. Darius had his faith in God confirmed and Cyrus received a lesson that he would not soon forget. It was also a fresh token to the Jews that God was still in their midst to bless them. To Daniel came the voice of God promising patience and strength to perform his duty as a servant of God. Greater light came to Daniel for it was after this experience that a large portion of the prophecies of the book of Daniel were given to him. Question 16. What did the king do after this event? Daniel 6, 25 to 28. Then King Darius wrote out, wrote, sorry. Then King Darius wrote unto all peoples, tongues, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth who had delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So like Nebuchadnezzar, King Darius made a decree. Right? But while Nebuchadnezzar's decree promised to cut people in downhill and destroy their house, he just made a decree that everyone should worship the God of heaven because he is the living God. And he's able to live, deliver and rescue and work wonders and sign in heaven that no other God can do. Right? So both kings, both Nebuchadnezzar and Darius made a decree in favor of God. Right? So this Darius proposed in the reign, sorry, sorry, my bad. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian, right? So Darius made a decree and Daniel continued to serve the king all the way, the Persian empire, all the way unto the, the reign of Cyrus. And that's when Daniel died in the reign of Cyrus as an old man right full of age praise be to the lord now listen god loves you and he wants to fight for you just as he did for daniel he knows that you are no match for satan the evil one he knows that but he cannot fight for you unless you are holy on his side being 99.99 percent .99 means you are not his at all if Satan has so much as a fingernail hole on you, you can't be God. You have got to be completely God. All right? You cannot allow Satan to have not even a point zero 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 one percent of your life. That, that will be poison to your spiritual life. And God cannot work for you. Right? And God wants you to be all his so that he can work for you. When your days in the lion den comes, when God wants to fight for you because he loves you, will you let him? If you believe the events of Daniel 6, please choose to serve God with all your heart. What he did for Daniel, he will also do for you right so my brothers and sisters and anyone watching this there is a god in heaven who wants to fight for you he wants to take care of all your problems but he cannot do it if you are one foot in the river and one foot on the back he cannot work for you if you are going to be serving another god even 0.001 percent you have got to be completely the lord's and he will work for you. And your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
And unless you walk away from God, it will remain there. Right? And my final question to you is this. What would prevent you from giving God your heart today? All of it. What would prevent you from giving God all of your heart? Let us pray. Most righteous and eternal Father and God, we thank you so much for this lesson that you have given us in your faithfulness to your people and in the possibility of us being faithful to you. Lord, we want to be faithful to you. But we admit, Lord, that sometimes we take our eyes off you and we begin to look at our problems and we become scared and we are tempted and sometimes we do fall away from being steadfast for you. But we are asking, Lord, that you will help us to keep our eyes single. Help us not to look at the problems around us, but to keep our eyes single. To look at you steadfast in the face and to see the love in your eyes. So that nothing that this world can bring our way in the form of a threat will cause us to let go our hold of you. Or to accept its false belief for just one minute. Help us to be like Daniel, Lord. Help us to stand alone. Help us to have a purpose firm and help us to make it known. You know, Father, when we are secretive about our problems, the devil has a hold on us. But if we are transparent and if we realize that like everybody else, we have problems and there is not a perfect man on earth, and so it's not ashamed to admit that we have failings as well the devil won't have a handle in our lives so help us to realize lord that we must be sincere transparent and not pretentious and that way he won't have such a hold on us and we'll be able to stand for you and when we do stand for you lord save us save us save us save our families save our friends save our co-workers Help us to all see you for who you are and to love and to serve you with all of our heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, we have finished with the historic part of Daniel from Daniel chapters 1 to chapter 6. And the next time we meet, we are going to be looking at the prophetic part. Right? So get your Bibles because you're going to have to be marking your Bibles as we go through this. From chapter 7 to chapter 12, we'll be, we'll be looking at the prophecies and we, and we will see the pattern of repeating the prophecy and enlarging the prophecies that God has used to confirm that the prophecies are true. So until next time, have a good day. Bye.